The Great Salt Lake is the largest saltwater lake in the Western Hemisphere. But did you know it's disappearing? As it shrinks, it leaves behind salty mudflats, toxic dust, and a lot of questions. Like, how did this lake form in the first place? Why is it so salty? Why is it shrinking? And what will happen when it's gone? Today, we're diving into the geologic past and uncertain future of Utah's most iconic body of water, the Great Salt Lake. This lake has historically covered an area of around 4,400 square kilometers, but now fluctuates dramatically. It has no outlet, making it what we call an endorheic basin. Water flows in, but not out. Its salinity ranges from around 6 to 30%, so much saltier than the ocean, which has an average of around 3.5% salinity. And the only organisms that can survive here are salt-loving microbes called halophiles, brine shrimp, brine flies, and massive migratory bird populations. Side note, the brine flies were actually super cool. They were like everywhere on the shore, and it was so, so cool to watch. We got some really cool shots. So how did the Great Salt Lake form, and how long has it been here? Well, this lake sits in what's called a graben, a block of crust that dropped down between faults during a period of extensional tectonic stress across much of western North America that began around 20 million years ago and continues today. We call this tectonic regime basin and range extension. And I talk more about what caused the crust to start stretching apart in past videos, so I'll link those down below. In any case, this crustal stretching and thinning formed north-south trending ranges and valleys. And one such valley became what is now the Great Salt Lake. But before it was the Great Salt Lake, it was actually Lake Bonneville. See, the Great Salt Lake is the shrunken remnant of Lake Bonneville, a vast freshwater lake that existed from around 30,000 to 13,000 years ago. At its largest, Lake Bonneville covered 50,000 square kilometers and was over 300 meters deep in some regions, which is crazy because the Great Salt Lake now at maximum is 10 meters deep. Then around 14,500 years ago came the Bonneville Flood, one of the largest and most catastrophic floods in the geologic history of North America. It was triggered by a shift in climate toward wetter and cooler conditions that caused Lake Bonneville to rise steadily until it overtopped a natural silt and gravel threshold at Red Rock Pass in southeastern Idaho. Once the water began spilling over, it rapidly eroded the loose materials, and the main flood surge lasted a few weeks to months and was extremely powerful. It carved out deep canyons and scablands, especially in southern Idaho. It also deposited thick alluvial sediments along Snake River Plain, altered nutrient and sediment flows, and undoubtedly disrupted local ecosystems. But after the flood, the lake stabilized at a new lower shoreline called the Provo shoreline, which is still visible on hillsides around Utah. And it continued to shrink as climate got warmer and drier until eventually, by around eight to 10,000 years ago, the Great Salt Lake was all that remained. So why is the Great Salt Lake so much saltier than Lake Bonneville was? Well, as mentioned earlier, the Great Salt Lake is an endorheic basin, meaning water comes in, but it doesn't go out. So shouldn't that mean the lake is infinitely growing rather than shrinking? Well, just because the water doesn't have any physical outlets from the lake to the ocean doesn't mean it can't leave the lake by other means. The primary outlet for the water in this lake is evaporation. And when the water evaporates, it leaves behind salts and minerals, concentrating the leftover water in these constituents. So essentially, rivers bring in the minerals, but without an outlet for these minerals, the minerals are left behind when the water evaporates. And because the transition of Lake Bonneville to the Great Salt Lake was driven in part by increased aridity or dryness, this would have driven high rates of evaporation and thus increased the concentration of salts in the remaining water. So the Great Salt Lake started off much saltier than Lake Bonneville and only continues to become saltier and saltier as it shrinks from increased evaporation. Since the 1980s, the Great Salt Lake has dropped over six meters or 20 feet. This change is in part due to hotter, drier conditions associated with climate change, but is also heavily due to water diversion for agriculture and urban use. In fact, about 70% of incoming flow is consumed by human use. 
And the disappearance of this lake may be extremely harmful to local ecosystems, including human communities. The exposed lake bed is an increasingly serious environmental and public health concern because as the lake dries, dust from the exposed salt flat is picked up by the wind, and this dust contains toxic metals like arsenic, mercury, lead, copper, nickel, and cadmium. These metals originated from upstream rocks, soils, and hydrothermal fluids, and were carried to and accumulated within the Great Salt Lake. But now, as they're being exposed to wind transport, they threaten air quality, agriculture, and human health. But this shrinking lake also threatens the organisms that live here, the brine shrimp industry, and bird migration patterns. So how do we fix this problem? I don't know. The obvious answer would be to decrease our diversion of the water flow that comes into the Great Salt Lake. But we need that water, especially as aridity continues to increase. So some of the proposed solutions include upgrading agricultural irrigation systems, incentivizing water saving practices, promoting drought tolerant landscaping, modernizing canals to reduce seepage, and even water banking and leasing programs that allow farmers, ranchers, or cities to temporarily lease or sell their unused water rights to the state or conservation groups for use in restoring the lake. And Utah's already piloting some of these programs. But even so, it's an ongoing issue that would benefit greatly from new young minds in geology, hydrology, engineering, and related fields. So if you're interested in those fields, I highly encourage you to look further into it. And finally, moving on to one of my favorite facts about the Great Salt Lake, that it's sometimes used as a Mars analog. Due to its high salinity and extreme microbes, this peculiar environment greatly interests astrobiologists who study where and how to find life on other planets and moons. For example, we think similar evaporative lake environments may have existed on ancient Mars. And thus understanding what kind of signatures these halophilic or salt-loving microbes leave behind in the rocks and minerals here in the Great Salt Lake could help us find similar signatures in the rocks and minerals on Mars. But if you want to know more about the microbes here, I'm actually going to make a whole separate video about that because there's these really cool things that are called microbialites that are kind of like stromatolites that live here and grow here in some of these areas of the lake shore and they're super cool and have so much more of a story behind them so be sure to check out that video once it comes out and although that's all I have for the geologic story and significance of the Great Salt Lake I do have a list of fun facts that I couldn't bring myself to exclude from the video so here they are fun fact number one the saltiest parts of the lake host halophilic arch a type of microbe that give the lake a pink hue. Fun fact number two, the Great Salt Lake has no fish, but brine shrimp eggs are harvested and sold globally for aquaculture. Fun fact number three, a railroad causeway built in the 1950s separates the lake into the north and south arms, and this has changed the chemistry of each of these arms. Less water flows into the north, making it much saltier, while the south arm is more dilute, and this difference has created a visible color divide from the pinkish saltier, more halophilic rich water in the north to the more blue-green diluted water of the south. And fun fact number four, although the Great Salt Lake has really high salt content which lowers its freezing point, there are parts of the lake that do freeze over in the winter during really extreme cold spells in shallow areas. So I hope you guys enjoyed learning those fun facts and about the geology of this super cool lake. And with that, I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye! <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so I hope you guys... <laughs>